research data are collected by measuring aspects of objects or events to describe what we are studying. The collected data are typically stored electronically in some numerical format. However, they are not just numbers. They are numbers with context, which makes the data informative and meaningful. In addition, not all observations possess all the characteristics of numbers. Because the data are basic um, ingredients of statistical recipe to follow, it is critical uh, to correctly identify the characteristics of those numbers assigned to each variable so that we can cook them properly. Not all the numbers contain the same amount of information. Depending upon the amount of information a datum possesses, a measurement variable can be categorized into four different levels of measurement. Here, the levels of measurement is a general classification to describe the nature of information within the numbers assigned to variables. In some cases, the boundaries between the levels uh, may not be so straightforward, but many times this is often a very useful scheme to identify and classify the variables to properly analyze them later on. So I strongly suggest that you get used to this scheme for what's coming later um, as identifying the correct level of measurement is critical for a later analysis. So our first level of measurement is the nominal level of measurement also known as categorical level of measurement. The type of data collected for this level of measurements are in the form of names, categories, or qualities. For example, let's say that you want to collect the data on the secondary schools in Glasgow region that your classmates attended and the values you can assign to the variable are like a Glasgow High, there's an academy or Douglas Academy and so on. Occupation uh, is another example of nominal level of measurement. So the values typically assigned to a nominal variable, as we have just seen, are the names or categories that are disjoint and exhaustive so that every observation falls into only one category. If a nominal variable has only two categories, then the variable has a special name called a binary or dichotomous variable. Um, a representative example would be gender, where there are only, uh, only female or male as possible values you can assign. Other example is a handedness, left or right. So categories in this uh, level of measurement are often assigned numerical values, but the choice of these values are completely arbitrary. So for example, we can assign one to represent male and two uh, for female to simplify the gender data. Um, I mean, this is completely arbitrary, so we can assign you know, three and four or five and six. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, whatever numbers you assign, as long as they are different numbers um, to represent female and male. Right? Because they are arbitrary, um, no arithmetic operations, including ordering between different categories, are allowed even when the data are recorded with numbers instead of words. So, for example, say now you assign one for female and or two for male this time. Can you add those two numbers to get three? I don't think so, um, because that means you're adding male and female. And what is the outcome of the addition? A baby? Well, uh, you know, that makes three, but um, you know, what if you have twins or triplets? Well, with all the jokes aside, I hope you see what I'm getting at. Um, also, um, you cannot rank order the categories in any directions. So say now you assign one for male and two for female. Does that mean the male is better than female? Uh, regardless of the reasons, just because male is assigned to one. 
I hope you don't answer yes to this question unless you're a sexist. So the only possible operations on the values of nominal variables are counting, meaning that you can only count how many times each category occurs, which is a statistics called frequency. Another possible operation is to compare whether any two categories are identical or not. For example, a male is the same as other male, um, so they can be categorized as a, as a male. That's what I'm saying, as long as they, they are males, right? And a male is different from a female. And when two categories are different, um, though usually nothing can be exactly said about how much they differ. So the next level of measurement in line is the ordinal level of measurement that has more information than the nominal measurement. So this level has all the properties of normal uh, nominal measurement plus ordering information between any two values. However, we still can, cannot tell anything about the nature of the difference between any two values from this level of a measurement. Again, numerical values are often assigned to this level of a measurement, but still no arithmetic operation is possible as any two consecutive values do not have the same interpretation throughout the scale. So a typical example of an ordinal level of a measurement is probably the N point. So N number of point rating scale, you may have seen a lot from the customer satisfaction survey. Here we have a five point rating scale to rate how much the respondent agrees or disagrees to the provided statements. There is an obvious order between the values of this scale as you can see, but it is not known if the difference between any two consecutive values or ratings, for example, between the neutral and agree is necessarily same as the difference between the disagree and the neutral. Another example of an ordinal level of a measurement is a pain scale as seen in this picture. Uh, this was devised to help people quickly point out the current pain level they're going through instead of them having to explain their pain. Understandably, the degree of pain we feel is quite subjective and it makes it very hard to objectively quantify as you are the only one who really knows just how bad your pain feels. So as you can see, the pain scale is ordered in increasing order from left to right, but we do not know if the difference in pain between no pain, right? Um, so the no pain and the mild level is necessarily the same as the difference in pain between the moderate and severe level of pain. Now, the interval level of measurement has all the properties of nominal and ordinal levels of measurement. Unlike the ordinal, Interval level has a numerical scale where differences between any two consecutive values are same throughout. Sometimes an interval scale includes the value of zero in its scale, but this zero here is not the absolute zero, representing the true absence of the property, magnitude, strength, or intensity that the scale is meant to measure. So one of the uh, very well-known example of the uh, interval level of a measurement is temperature measured in Celsius. As you can see from the picture, uh, we can see that the tick marks are all equidistant each other and the scale includes zero in the middle. However, this is not a true absolute zero because zero Celsius does not mean the absence of temperature. It is just a relative position between hot and cold. As there is no absolute zero in this level of measurement, in theory, direct multiplication or division between the values of interval level of a measurement is not meaningful. However, 
people perform such operations quite frequently in practice with the interval level of a measurement, even though what's truly meaningful is the uh, ratio of differences only. Um, any cyclic data, such as time of the day or angle of an arc in degree, are other examples of the interval level of measurement. Finally, the ratio level of measurement is at the top of all the levels of a measurement. This level has all the properties of the previous three levels plus absolute zero, so which is a unique and non-arbitrary value. So the absolute zero here represents the theoretical absence of the quantity or property you are measuring. For example, when the variable body weight is measured in kilogram, then the zero kilogram here can be assigned to mean the com complete absence of weight, even though we know that it does not actually happen in real life. Categories from this level of a measurement have all the arithmetic characteristics of numbers, so any arithmetic operation is allowed. Now that I explained all the properties of the four levels of measurement, I hope you can identify the proper level of measurement when you are given various variables of measurement um, because it will be very, very important for later data analysis. So um, here are a list, uh, here is a list of some variables and for each variable, I invite you to figure out uh, the proper level of a measurement by thinking about the typical values you can assign to the variables. So start with the uh, glucose concentration measured in milligram per deciliter. So if you think about um, the values you can assign to the glucose concentration, um, you actually use the, the, the real numbers, right? So say the 17 millimeter, um, the, the, um, I don't know uh, what, what concentration is actually normal uh, glucose concentration, but say like you know, 17, 20, 21. See, you can use the real numbers. Uh, that you can actually do some mathematical operations on them, right? So we know that at least this uh, variable, glucose concentration, is interval level of measurement, right? Because, you know, the difference between 17 and 18, um, that should be the same as the difference between 18 and 19. There's a one uh, milligram per deciliter difference in concentration. So any two consecutive concentrations uh, has the same interpretation throughout the scale, throughout the other variable glucose concentration. Now you need to check if this uh, variable has the absolute zero point representing the absence of the measurement. And it does, right? So it can have zero milligram per deciliter to represent absence of concentration. So there's no concentration. There's no concentration of a glucose, right? So that makes glucose concentration um, the ratio level of measurement. Okay, so let's move on to the next variable. Programs in biological sciences, for example, biomedical science, food bioscience, pharmacology, pharmacology and so on. Right? So the variable here is a program in biological sciences, and the values uh, you can assign to these variables are uh, the subcategories, the categories here, right? Biomedical, food bioscience, and so on. So the values here are the categories, or they're just names, right? And you cannot really do anything um, uh, about in terms of um, the mathematical operations between these values, right? You cannot even rank order between these different programs, can you? I don't think so, right? So there is no better or worse program. So that makes the programs in uh, biological sciences a nominal level of measurement, okay? 
And the blood pressure uh, measured in millimeter mercury. So this is another ratio level of measurement, right? Because uh, um, in measuring blood pressure, we use real numbers and you can have, in theory, have zero millimeter mercury. Um, so that is the point where there's no blood pressure, right? So if you have zero blood pressure, that means you're dead. So the answer for the blood pressure variable is at the ratio level of measurement. And the last one, and the variable name is uh, the resp uh, responses from survey or questionnaire. And then the example values you can assign to this variable are like a strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. Right, so even though these values are categorical, uh, we can see that you can actually rank order these values, right? Even though we do not know if the difference between strongly agree and agree is, the ne is necessarily the same as the difference between disagree and strongly disagree because, you know, these um, categories are kind of a subjective. Okay? However, we can still rank order them in the order of kind of an you know, increasing order or decreasing order. Right. So this makes the variable responses from survey or questionnaire an ordinal level of measurement. So I hope this all kind of makes sense to you now. And hopefully um, you can identify the proper level of measurement when you are given different variables. Now that you learned about all the levels of a measurement, you should be able to classify your data into one of the four categories in practice, right? Well, it may take some time to get used to this, but you'll get the hang of it. In addition to identifying the proper level of measurement for your collected data in an experimental research, there is another practical consideration you need to take account into, which is the errors in measurement. So you probably agree that no me measurements are free from error, so, and it does happen. So it is very important to characterize and manage these errors when we measure something um, to collect the data. In doing so, we need to understand how these errors are characterized and reported. Um, with the exception of obvious human errors, such as finger errors, measurement errors due to other uncontrollable and unknown sources are statistically characterized by two quantities, uh, namely accuracy and precision. To establish these two quantities, repeated measurements per sample or subject are strongly recommended, which is called a technical replicate. So what I'm showing you here is a vision science example of technical replicates uh, when measuring the pressure in the eye. The pressure in the eye is one of the important indicators of eye health, so accurate and precise measurement of the pressure is required. So the uh, equipment to measure the eye pressure is called a tonometer, and the machine in this video is a portable handheld version of tonometer. So in this high resolution, uh, uh, super slow-mo video, the device measured the eye pressure with a tiny probe by gently drumming down the cornea, the surface of the eye, six times in a split second. And it'll provide the accuracy and precision of the given measurement, where accuracy is calculated by averaging the six measurements, and the precision is calculated by the standard deviation, which is a statistical quantity to measure how much spread there is from the center of the data. So the center of the data here is the average. So um, we're going to have a chance to talk about all this statistical quantity later on in the exploratory data analysis. Even though they are used interchangeably in everyday language, as if they are the same, 
they actually mean different from the context of uh, metrology, which is the uh, science of uh, measurement. In a stricter sense, uh, accuracy represents the degree of how close a measurement is to the true value, which is typically unknown to us that we try to estimate. When your measurement is far away from the true value, then your measurement is called biased. However, knowing this quantity alone is not enough to describe the measurement characteristics of a device because accuracy alone does not tell us how reproducible or reliable a measurement is. Therefore, we need another component of errors in measurement called precision. So precision is defined as the degree of how close a set of measurements is to each other, given that they are obtained in exactly the same manner. The concept of precision is closely related to reliability of a measurement, and the opposite is a variability of a measurement. Sometimes precision is confused with the measurement resolution, but they are different in that the latter represents the smallest difference that can be meaningfully distinguished by the measurement. Now, we can use the target and shooter metaphor to illustrate the difference between the accuracy and precision visually. For example, here we have a red target and shooting results are represented by the black dots. The aim of the shooter is the very center of the concentric target. So let's say that this is the shooter one and needless to, uh, needless to say, we can all agree that this shooter is very accurate as well as precise because all the shots landed at the center of the target and they are very close to each other. On the other hand, um, what about the uh, this shooter too, number two? Unless she or he aimed at the corner on purpose, um, the average location of the shots are actually far from the center. However, we can see that the shooter is at least quite precise as all the shots are very close together, no matter how far they are from the center. So what is possibly going on here would be that the gun is not calibrated well. Now, this shooter is less accurate compared to the first shooter, but better than the shooter too in terms of accuracy as the shots are more or less scattered around the center. However, precision of the shooter is less than the previous shooter too as the shots are more spread out. And finally, whoa, look at this. Uh, of all the shooters, uh, this one is the worst in terms of both accuracy and precision. The shots are all over the place and I can call this a shooter a lousy shooter. So um, we can put together all the shooters in a, uh, in a single graph like this. So on the vertical axis, we have the accuracy um, increasing from bottom to top. And on the horizontal axis, we have precision increasing from left to right. We can characterize the accuracy and precision in a different way. Imagine that you collected hundreds of measurements of something, say, like IOP, the intrusive pressure, from a single subject using a method and plotted them on a graph like this. The type of graph shown here is called a histogram, where the horizontal axis represents the measurement values and the vertical axis represents how frequent each measurement value appeared. A single vertical line on the right here um, that um, represents the location of the true value we are trying to estimate. And from this representation, uh, the center of the histogram in green roughly uh, represents the average of hundreds of measurements, and the accuracy is estima estimated by the distance between the true value and the average measurement. 
whereas the spread of the histogram in red represents precision. So from this, we can call this measurement as inaccurate as well as imprecise, as the distance between the true value and average, and the average uh, is quite far away each other, and the distribution has a large spread. On the other hand, the method two, so you measure the same entropy pressure, but using different method two, now it looks like a more precise than the previous measurement as the spread of the histogram is narrower than the first one. However, the method is still inaccurate as the distance between the true value and the average measurement is large. And now you use another uh, different method three, and now it looks like it's accurate uh, in that the average measurement is now very close to the true value. However, the method is still imprecise as the spread of the distribution is quite large. And finally, the last method is precise as well as accurate compared to all three previous methods as the location of the average is almost right on top of the true value that we're trying to estimate and the spread of the distribution is also narrower than all the other methods. So I hope you now understand the difference between the accuracy and precision of measurement. So to make sure that you understood what I said about the accuracy and precision, let's take another example to illustrate the difference between the two. So say in a hypothetical study, you develop three methods to measure blood pressure. But to see how each method fare against the gold standard, um, so you can think of a gold standard as the kind of a best measurement um, or best method available at the moment. Um, so you measured blood pressure five times uh, with each method. Uh, and the numbers in the table are the collected data. So given the data, you want to find out which method is most reliable, i.e. most precise. And secondly, which method is most biased, i.e. inaccurate. And finally, which method is the most accurate. So let's just start with the uh, method one. So if you look at the average of these five measurements, um, it is actually the, the average is the same as the, the data, right? So the mean is 65. So the average of the measurement is basically the, the accuracy, okay? You compare this against the gold standard value, which is 70 millimeter mercury. So that is five millimeter mercury difference between the gold standard and the uh, the method one measurement right okay and how about the spread in fact there is no spread for the method one right every time you measure the blood pressure it is just giving you the exactly the same blood pressure right so there is no variation whatsoever so in terms of precision or reliability uh, probably the method one is the best because there is no variation whatsoever right every time you measure something um, it's just giving you the exactly the same number so the method one is probably the uh, most precise uh, method so let's look at the, um, the method two then um, so if we look at the method two um, the mean so let's just calculate the mean of uh, the method two. It is actually ranging from 66 to 70. So I believe 68 is the middle score, right? So I'm pretty sure that uh, 68 is the mean for the method two. And in terms of accuracy, then you compare this 68 as a mean against 70, right? So that then there's a kind of a so there's only two 
millimeter mercury difference between these two methods, right? So in terms of accuracy, method two is better than the method one because the method one, the difference between the average of the method one and gold standard was five, but the difference is two now between the method two and the gold standard. In terms of accuracy, um, method two is better than method one, that's for sure. But in terms of precision, it is not uh, better than the method one because there is definitely a variation. Uh, one uh, of the methods to quantify the precision is to calculate the range. So range is basically the difference between the maximum value in a data set and the minimum value in the same data set. So the range here is range is basically 70 minus 70 minus 66 is 4. Okay. And but for method one, the range is zero. Right? There is no uh, difference uh, whatsoever. Now let's look at the method three. And so this is uh, actually ranging from 68 to 72. So I believe the middle value is 70, right? So the average uh, uh, for method three should be 70. And voila, look at that. If you compare this value against the gold standard, it is exactly the same as the gold standard, right? So in terms of accuracy, uh, method three is the winner, right? Because um, it, just the, the average um, measurement of the method three is just a uh, you know, bang on the gold standard value. However, it has actually the same range as the method two, I believe. So the range here is a 72 minus 68. So it's a four. So in terms of range, so in terms of precision measured in range, method two and method three has four, right? So in terms of precision, method one is the winner. But in terms of accuracy, method three is the winner. And in terms of most um, inaccurate measurement, right, that is method one, right, because the difference between uh, the average measurement of the method one and the gold standard is five, right? So method one is the most precise method, but at the same time, it is the most inaccurate method. So I hope that this all makes sense to you. And I guess this is all I have to say for this week. So um, do let me know if you have any questions. And now um, to the summary slide.